We have dedicated the opening of our festival in Munich this year to Hermes, the messenger of the gods. And in view of all that we desire to see and feel in spiritual science, we may perhaps regard this fact as symbolical. For spiritual science is not only for us a fount of wisdom or knowledge, as any other wisdom or knowledge in the world might be, but it is an actual mediator between ourselves and those worlds above us from which, according to the belief of ancient Greece, Hermes brought down to men the spark that could kindle within them those forces by which they might rise to supersensible realms. In this connection, let me add, in the course of this introduction, something to all that has delighted us in the representation of the mystery plays during the last few days, so that it may unite and form one whole with the subjects to be discussed during the next few days. These representations are not given merely to enhance the beauty of our festival. They must be regarded as organically associated in the most intimate manner with what forms the central point in the annual gathering we have now held here for several years and of our activities in this place. We have been able this year to inaugurate our festival by the revival of that drama which is, without exception, the origin of all Western dramatic art, that drama which we can only comprehend if we extend our view beyond all the dramatic art transmitted to the West by history. And here we have the reason why this drama is particular to a worthy introduction to our anthroposophical undertaking, for it takes us back to those periods of European civilization in which the different currents of human spiritual aspiration represented today by science, religion, and art were not as yet separate, but on the contrary were closely united. In doing this we turn in feeling to those primal ages of European civilization, to those ages in which a uniform culture, born directly of the most profound spiritual life, kindled in human souls the sparks of religious aspiration toward the highest to which man could possibly aspire with his whole soul. A culture throbbing with pure religious life. It may be said that that culture was religion. Religion was not then a special domain to which man turned as to something outside his life. Even when he spoke of those elements of spiritual life which entered immediately into the practical matters of everyday existence, his speech was pervaded by religion. This penetration of daily life by religion elevated the soul in a way which shed its light over all the experiences of human life. Religion, however, was intrinsically too powerful to remain within the limits of a vague extension of religious emotions up to the great powers of the universe. This primal religion of mankind was so mighty that it inspired the different forces of human spiritual life so that they assumed forms which were directly those of art. Religious life poured into vigorous forms. Religion and art were one. Art was the true daughter of religion and lived in the closest kinship with her mother, religion. In our day there is no such feeling of religious depth as that which stirred the souls of all who were able to take part in the old mysteries and see how religious life permeated the works of art presented to man's view. This primal religion with her daughter art were both so purified in the etheric spheres of spiritual life that as a result of their influence on the human soul, there issued from that soul as a faint, abstract reflection the science and learning of our day. When intense feelings were inspired by the force which streamed as religion into artistic forms, the knowledge of the gods and of divine things, the knowledge of the spiritual realms, 
was kindled in the soul. Thus science or learning was the other daughter of religious life, united like her sister, art, in close family bonds, and intimately associated with the primeval mother of all civilization, religion. If today we ask our hearts how far we intend to carry the work, at present only in its feeble initial stage, and what is our final aim in this work, the answer must be, quote, to inflame the hearts of men once more, with the desire for union and harmony between science and art. Close quote. In this way alone can the outlook of the human soul, fired by the feeling and invigorated by the power of our will, imbue all human culture with that spirit of unity which will raise man again to the spiritual heights of existence and simultaneously enter into the most ordinary actions of our daily life. What before was mere profane life, grown profane because its connection with the spiritual primal source of all existence had been forgotten, will be sanctified anew. <laughs> Thus, through an effort like ours of this year, we should like to point to a feeling which must animate us, if the truths which we call anthroposophy or occult science are to find a home in the depths of the human soul. In it we find the reason why it may be considered as anthroposophical, in the truest sense of the word, to look upon this very, quote, mystery of Eloisis, close quote, as a kind of sun, whose rays illuminating our hearts may awaken in us a perception of the real nature of occult science. That which is generally known as the drama, that which is felt by the Western world to be dramatic art, and which reached its culminating point in Shakespeare, is a stream of spiritual life having its source in the ancient mysteries. It is a secularization of the ancient mysteries. If we trace dramatic art back to its cradle, we find it in ancient mysteries, such as those of Eloisus. Having thus given general expression to the thoughts which filled our hearts a year ago at the International Theosophical Congress, when this very drama was produced, perhaps I may now be allowed to touch upon some points in particular, which, as everyday matters, in the best sense of the word, are closely connected with the spiritual ideal by which we are inspired and are calculated to throw some light on our aims and determination. Some time ago, as we were preparing for the performance of the, quote, children of Lucifer, close quote, I reminded you that a thought then presented itself to my mind, which I considered to be profoundly linked with our anthroposophical development at the present day. As I had reason to believe that the time had come to bring my own spiritual aspirations into conjunction with what may be called anthroposophy or spiritual science, here was a gateway through which I might attempt to steer my course by joining a discussion on anthroposophy to this drama, the, quote, children of Lucifer, close quote. An evolutionary period of seven years was then allowed to elapse as regards the theosophical work projected by us. But the germ then laid in our souls with the words relating to the children of Lucifer followed, meanwhile, their regular course of development silently in our hearts. And at the end of seven years we were in a position to present the children of Lucifer on the stage as an introduction to our gathering here. At this time I may perhaps be allowed to associate my introductory remarks to the course of lectures which is to occupy us during the next few days with certain others. For I am speaking to you, my dear friends, out of a full heart, and at the same time from the deepest conviction of my soul. That anthroposophical life, which in the future will ever more and more take hold of the spiritual thought of the West, must assume a form altogether peculiar in its character. Spiritual science may be thought of in the most manifold ways. Men do not always 
think in accordance with the necessities of existence, with the forces at work in human evolution. They think in conformity with their own will, with their own feelings. And then one person may consider one thing, another something else, as the true anthroposophical ideal. Thus there will be many anthroposophical ideals, according to the nature of the various hearts, according as they are inclined this way or that by their feelings and sensations. True occultism, however, in its higher form, shows that devotion to ideals such as these is nevertheless something which clings to our personality and which may be characterized as follows. Such anthroposophical ideals are really only what one person or another would like to see in anthroposophy, or what, because of his cherished feelings and his particular type of intellect, he believes to be the best. How else do people judge of anything belonging to ordinary life than by the standard of their most cherished feelings and their own personal motives? But anthroposophy must teach us not to look upon that which springs from our personal feelings as a standard to be applied generally. As persons, we are always liable to err, however firmly we may believe ourselves to be devoted to an unselfish ideal. We can only form an opinion as to how to promote the evolution of the race when we have completely suppressed our personal views regarding that ideal, and when we have ceased to ask what we personally consider to be the best manner of representing anthroposophical teachings. A true opinion can only be arrived at if we allow the necessities of life to speak for themselves quite regardless of our own inclinations to one particular expression of anthroposophical life or another, or whether one or the other is more to our liking. In this sense we must ask ourselves, what for centuries has been the outcome of European civilization, and what does it demand in the near future? If we put this query without pledging ourselves personally to any solution, we receive a twofold answer. The first and great answer which confronts us in every event relating to spiritual life at the present day is that if Europe is to be saved from decay and desolation, it must have anthroposophy. The second reason is as follows. The anthroposophy demanded by Europe must be of a nature to respond to the fundamental conditions which have developed during the course of centuries, not in any one individual, but in European humanity as a whole. A system of anthroposophy which satisfies these conditions of European civilization can, however, only be given if we ask ourselves unselfishly, how have the peoples of Europe learned to feel and to think for centuries past, and for what does the European of our day yearn as a means to deepen his spiritual life. All the signs of the times show us that satisfaction of this yearning cannot be through a continuation of the ordinary mystic teaching familiar to us for ages, whose influence upon the various nations has for thousands of years been fraught with such blessings. The mere continuation of that mystic lore in the form in which we have always known it, and history has transmitted it, cannot possibly find acceptance as a means of satisfying the needs of Europe. To persist in immersing ourselves in ancient mystic lore alone would be to sin against European life and everything connected therewith, and would be placing our personal inclinations higher than the needs of existence. To whatever form of ancient mystic learning our personal tastes may incline, let us suppress them and ask ourselves, what are the needs of mankind under conditions which are the outcome of past centuries? The signs of the time show that what we call modern scientific research, high as is its reputation at the present day and great as is the authority which it enjoys, is past its prime, 
and is only able to produce the scantiest fruit for the future. I know that it may be thought a bold assertion, but it is not a careless one. To describe what is known today as exact science as a dying branch in the sphere of human intellect. <laughs> exact science has done its work. It is not disparaged by having light shed upon its conditions, as in the words just spoken. Neither ancient mysticism nor modern science will be of any use to the humanity of the future. It asserts its deepest need for the establishment of a bond between the human soul and the revelations of the Spirit. This was the thought that stood out as if inscribed in letters of gold upon the ideal hovering before our mental vision, when years ago we began to develop theosophic life on broader lines. And if I may now be allowed to express the thoughts which, as I have said, spring as much from the heart as from rational conviction, I would say, Consider quite objectively and without bias that with the great initiates, in quotes, a title, the work of our revered friend Edward Charest, the most notable commencement has been made in that kind of spiritual life, for which a widespread longing will make itself felt among the peoples of Europe in the future. And that spiritual life holds the middle place between a purely historical, mystic learning garnered from traditional documents and that science which is comparable to a dying branch on the tree of human civilization. <clears throat> to the eye of one who observes life as it really is, in a truly anthroposophical spirit, that spiritual current trickles now like a tiny rill, but it will widen in the future into a broad stream. At the beginning of our meeting here last year, I took occasion to point out that one who can to some extent foretell future events and can discern what the future will require of us, knows that in that work the golden mean in literature has been found between ancient mystic lore and modern but effete science, and that the beautiful and remarkable new departure in literature, which has already been made and given to all European nations entitled The Great Initiates, will continue to grow and develop new forms. Such a person knows that this work is characterized by a shade of thought which impresses us favorably, not because our will is biased by our personal anthroposophical inclinations, but because we see how the conditions of European civilization which force themselves upon our notice demand more and more insistently, urged by the necessities of their spiritual existence that this literary beginning should be made. If you are acquainted with that book, you also know in what a significant way attention is drawn in it to the mystery of Eloisis. This is more fully developed later by the same author in his Sanctuaries of the Orient. Such are the thoughts which this allusion to the mysteries in the great initiates, given in the truest spirit of theosophy, are able to awaken in our souls. When we turn in thought to the earliest beginnings of European art and spiritual life, we immediately find ourselves in the presence of two figures, which have a deep meaning for all those who possess a veritable anthroposophical grasp of modern spiritual life in all its aspects. Two figures which in the first place appear to us as symbolic representations of great spiritual impulses. To anyone who can look below the surface and into the spiritual life of the present day, these two figures illumine the future like rays of light and proclaim tidings of the utmost moment. They are Persephone and Iphigenia. In them we mention two types of soul common to modern humanity, two types whose union demands the severest probations of the human soul. We shall see still more clearly in the course of the next few days how Persephone arouses in our hearts thoughts of an impulse to which we have often had occasion to allude in our anthroposophical studies. It was formerly the common lot of humanity to acquire knowledge in a manner different from that now prevailing. 
From Ethoposophical lectures we know of an ancient seership, once possessed by mankind, which in past ages welled up spontaneously in human nature, so that clairvoyant images took shape in the human soul in the same way as hunger and thirst and the need for breathing arise in our bodies, and that those images were filled with the mysteries of the spiritual world. This was the primal gift of seership, once common to all men, of which they were bereft, as we might say, by what at a later period in the life of humanity became knowledge. The Greek of old saw with the partial perception of his day that the rape of ancient clairvoyance by modern science was being accomplished, and that in the future the loss of clairvoyance would become ever more general. And he turned in spirit to that divine form of elemental nature by whose power the forces were liberated which bestowed on the human soul that ancient gift of seership. He looked up to that goddess called Persephone, who was the regent of the old clairvoyance, which was inseparable from human nature. The Greek reflected that the era of ancient seership would be gradually and surely replaced by a new civilization, governed by and born of a race to whom the old seership had been lost. In ancient Greece, represented by the names of Agamemnon, Odysseus, and Menelaus, we recognize our own outer intellectual civilization untouched by the forces of clairvoyance. At the present day, it is no longer felt that a civilization which produces a kind of science serving alike to fathom the mysteries of existence, as in philosophy, and to forge canon by the knowledge of natural laws, demands in a deeper sense those sacrifices which the human being must offer to the highest spiritual intelligences who guide the supersensible worlds. Such sacrifices are actually offered, but unobserved, because as yet no one gives heed to such things. The ancient Greek observed that the modern civilization which he coupled with the names of Agamemnon, Menelaus, and Odysseus demanded sacrifices, that it was the daughter of the human spirit, who, in a certain sense, had continually to be sacrificed. He represented this ever-recurring sacrifice to intellectual culture as the sacrifice of the daughter of Agamemnon, Iphigenia. To the question suggested by the sacrifice of Iphigenia comes a wondrous answer. If that outer, intellectual civilization had been the only form of civilization which could be associated, in the true Greek sense, with the names of Agamemnon, Menelaus, and Odysseus, then the soul and heart forces of mankind would long ago have been exhausted under its influence. It was only because man retained the feeling that he must ceaselessly offer up sacrifices and extract from general intellectual civilization that other kind of force which might, not in a superficial but in a deeper sense, be called a sacerdotal culture. It was only because of this that our civilization has been preserved from decay. As Iphigenia was offered up to Artemis, and through the sacrifice became a priestess, so certain aspects of our intellectual civilization have been forced repeatedly in bygone centuries to undergo a cleansing and purifying process of a religious or priestly nature, as an offering to the higher gods, in order that that outer intellectual culture might not blight humanity, heart, and soul. Thus Persephone, represents to us the guide and guardian of the old clairvoyant age, while in Iphigenia we have the representative of the never-ending sacrifice which our superficial intellectualism must offer up to the deeper religious life. <coughs> the things which I have just disclosed to you have always existed as living truths in the stream of cultured European life, beginning with that of ancient Greece and continuing down to the most recent times. They have lived on from the time when Socrates first separated 
purely scientific thought from the old undifferentiated culture until now. Goethe's words sound to us mysteriously in his Iphigenia. Let us again recall the never-ending sacrifice which intellectual culture must offer up to religious culture. Otherwise intellectualism will bring destruction on the European races. A rude, rough atmosphere for the higher life of the spirit, rough as King Thoas in Iphigenia, is in a certain respect the achievement of intellectual culture in its widest scope. Mild and harmonious is that which speaks to us in the symbol of Iphigenia, not to hate with those who hate in human life, but to love with those who love. The first reminder of the weightiest impulses in the spiritual life of Europe was given in that moment when the heart of Goethe was inspired to present Iphigenia to the European world as a reminder of the everlasting sacrifice of intellectualism. We can feel here that Goethe's soul was irradiated by the spiritual inspires of modern times. A second reminder, which was somewhat longer delayed, became necessary. This was one which carries us back to those times when the old clairvoyant civilization, associated with the name of Persephone, still prevailed. In reading that passage in the Grand Initiates, which reaches its culminating point with the allusion to the mystery of Eloises, one feels how the spiritual life of Europe works together with its inspirers to bring forth, as by enchantment, from the twilight of the ages, truths that must lead us more and more to realize that the old clairvoyant culture, typified in the name of Persephone, must be revived. One pole of modern European spiritual life was given us in the rejuvenation of the old Greek form of Iphigenia. The other pole we find in the new creation of the mystery of Eloises by Edward Charest. We must regard it as due to one of the most felicitous of the stars which rule over our theosophical, anthroposophical life that it has been possible to illumine that life by this inauguration in presence of the Creator or author of the new mystery of Eloises, who for several years of our spiritual endeavors has rejoiced us by his presence. As I said, what I have just expressed is only in one aspect a thought of the heart. In the other aspect it is a thought springing from the most sober and most objective conviction. I have given expression to it today because I am compelled to agree with Goethe's words which vibrate like a wondrous note of wisdom in our mental life, quote, nothing is true but that which proveth fruitful, close quote. If some fruitfulness be detected in our labors of past years, it may be taken for granted that the thought which has long inspired our work and is always present like a hidden guest, like a hidden fellow combatant, has proved true by its fruitfulness. To all that might be associated with the thoughts, I have just expressed in connection with the names of Iphigenia and Persephone, we shall return, making use of them in the most diverse ways, in treating of the Quote, wonders of, the na- of nature, the trials of the soul, and the revelations of the spirit. Should be wonders of the world, sorry. End of footnote. <clears throat> First, however, be it mentioned that as Iphigenia is the daughter of Agamemnon, okay, let me stop for a second here. It should be, uh, let me read that quote again. Wonders of nature is what Steiner probably said. Wonders of nature, the trials of the soul, and the revelations of the spirit. Okay. First, however, be it mentioned that as Iphigenia is the daughter of Agamemnon, one of those heroes to whom ancient Greece ascribes the cultivation of the intellect in its widest sense, including all its practical and warlike aspects, so Persephone is the daughter of Ceres, or Demeter. Now we shall see how Demeter is the ruler of the greatest wonders of nature, a primordial form of human feeling, thought and volition, whose true daughter is Persephone, that primordial form which points us to ages in which, in the human life of the human body, nutrition by outer substances and thinking by the instrument of the brain 
were not separate functions. In those days it was still felt that thought was alive out in the fields when the young corn throve. That hope actually lay extended over the meadows, penetrating the miracles of nature like the song of the lark. It was still felt that, along with material substances, spiritual life came and went in the human body, that the body was purified, became spirit as the All-Mother, from whom Persephone is born elementally, herself entered into human nature. The name of Demeter points us back to those primal ages of human evolution, in which human nature still worked so uniformly that all bodily life was at the same time spiritual life, that all bodily assimilation was closely united with the spiritual assimilation of thought. It is only the Akashic records that can give us a picture of the conditions of those times. That Persephone was the true daughter of Demeter we find on consulting the Akashic records. We shall likewise find that in Eros, the figure which meets us at the beginning of this new creation of the mystery of Aloysius, we have a personification of that influence by which, according to the feeling of the ancient Greeks, the forces of Demeter within evolving humanity have gradually become what they are today. The whole marvel of human nature is immediately conjured up in our soul when Demeter stands before us with the stern admonition of a primeval force, permeating all human feeling as if by enchantment. In Demeter something stands before us which speaks through the eons of time as an impulse of human nature. We feel the rush of that impulse from the stage when Demeter appears as the great representative of that mighty primal force to which we now give only the abstract name of human chastity, that mighty force which with all its fruitful reality is not asceticism, but which comprises the original love of humanity. On the other hand, what speaks to us from Eros, budding, innocent love, the ruler of which the Greeks felt to be Eros. The drama develops further. And what are those forces which work with tragic force from beginning to end of it? The interplay of chastity, which is at the same time primal love with its fertility, and innocent budding love, these reign in the drama, as positive and negative electricity reign without in the most ordinary of nature's miracles. Therefore a feeling more or less conscious may pervade the stage which is filled by this remarkable primeval human drama, concerning forces which have been at work in humanity since the beginning of time and which still permeate our modern life. Only, and here again I touch on something which will be amplified in the course of the next few days, only in a certain respect these primal currents of force, the Demeter and the Eros currents, will be more and more absorbed in the future of the human race by those other currents of force personified by the three figures Luna, Astrid, and Philea. These are characters in the mystery plays, a living link must rise up before the eye of the soul, connecting, on the one hand, the forces which are those appertaining to the origin of man, Demeter, Eros, with Persephone standing between them, and on the other hand those which begin to dawn on us in a form as yet impersonal. It is like a spiritual conscience calling to us from the unknown, as yet impossible of representation on the stage. It is but a voice from without. We recognize it in the three forms, true daughters of Demeter, who are Luna, Philea, and Astrid. See the Rosicrucian play, quote, at the portal of initiation, close quote. I have endeavored to characterize the feelings which have led me to place Edward Charest's new creation of the, quote, mystery of Eloises, close quote, at the commencement of our program. In consequence of all that has taken place, in preceding years, you will consider the words that are spoken today regarding this most remarkable work from the point of view which should be natural to all of us within the anthroposophical movement. What does this point of view require of us? 
Now it is extremely easy, indeed mere child's play, considering all that the world outside has to offer as dramatic art, to reproach us with shortcomings, perhaps also with dilettantism, which is evident when we bring our feeble powers to bear on the production of such an important work as the mystery of Aloysius. But it is by no means our object, or rather it must not be our object, to present this drama in the manner of the ordinary stage representations of the day. Those, however, in whom a feeling has been awakened for that which we desire to bring about, by impressing on art the spiritual character peculiar to anthroposophy, will realize that our aim is of a different nature. They will know also that everything which requires time to ripen to a future perfection must bear an imperfect form in the present. We are not called upon to compete with the performances on the ordinary stage. We do not dream of emulating those performances in any particular, and the mere comparison of our representations with such is a mistake. Whatever may be said by the art critic from the standpoint of the usual theatrical performance is dilettantism compared with the actual aims and objects of anthroposophy, as they are and must be in art as in all else. Those among you who feel with me and can share that deep feeling of gratitude which fills me toward all those who have been helpful on these occasions, will not consider it irrelevant or personal if this year I again give expression to deep feelings of gratitude at the close of my introductory lecture. Not only are many hands necessary to make these performances possible, but souls are also needed which are really saturated with something which may grow into the most splendid fruit of anthroposophical life, something which I should like to call anthroposophical ardor. And in truth, this anthroposophical ardor never remains unfruitful. It never fails gradually to develop a capacity for that which is striven after in its respective domain. And thus we find ourselves as a small group of anthroposophists, each time when we begin our task, the forerunners, at first, of that larger community which then assembles in this place, we find ourselves filled with anthroposophical ardor. We have faith in our work. We are convinced that though at first our work may be beset with stumbling blocks and difficulties, it must succeed. And it does succeed, as far as our capacities extend. We always find in this undertaking a tangible proof that spiritual forces rule over the world, that they help us, and that we may trust ourselves to them. When sometimes it has appeared to us as if our efforts would not succeed, we have said to ourselves that if we fail, then this too must be the intention of the forces at work behind our efforts, and then it would be right that we should fail. <clears throat> Thus we act without thinking of the result of our labors. We remember the spiritual forces to whom, in accordance with the spirit of our age, we desire to offer our poor and insignificant sacrifice, the sacrifice of modern intellectuality, in order that religious feeling may be intensified in the human breast. It is beautiful to see in what a real way anthroposophical ardor is present in this little group how each individual actually experiences anthroposophy by undertaking a work of sacrifice, which is by no means easy. It is a work performed by brothers in anthroposophy, in which others who cooperate each play their part. Those who understand what I mean by these words will share in the feelings of gratitude to which I here give expression. Our thanks are, of course, due in the first place to the author of the new mystery of Aloysius, and secondly to my numerous fellow workers during this time. Among these our thanks go out to those especially who, owing to the warm love with which their anthroposophical work has been imbued, have fitted themselves to aid us in realizing our aims by their talents and enthusiasm. Allow me, in the first place, to gratify a sincere wish in alluding to those two persons who cooperated with us in a very specially anthroposophical manner, so that we are everywhere impressed by the most beautiful harmony between their anthroposophical thought 
and their purely technical work in the promotion of our efforts here. Let me mention our good friend Aronson, who, as in former years, has contributed the musical part of our performances on all three occasions. I leave it to your hearts and souls to judge of these productions. For myself, I consider it as a mark of special good fortune that the musical part of our performances should have been contributed precisely in this way. And I feel it as a particularly favorable stroke of destiny that the stage effects, inspired by a truly religious spirit, should have been carried out so admirably by Baronin von Eckartstein. To me, every red and blue fleck of light, every high and every subdued tone in the scenic effect is important and full of meaning. I need only remind you of all that, in the scenery in general, contributed to the dramatic performance by our artists, and in mentioning them I hope to awaken in you understanding of the fact that the anthroposophical thought by which the souls of these individuals are filled has found its way even into their paintbrushes. What you see in the scenery as the work of these three individuals is anthroposophical. In all that is here referred to, nothing is perfect. It is but the beginning of that toward which we are striving. In all our aims, which cannot as yet be carried out, we should like to show what, in an anthroposophical sense, we imagine the future development of art may be. For this reason, it is of infinite importance to us that the inner dramatic representations of all we have in view should be in the hands only of anthroposophically minded artists. For it is, it is my desire, not from personal inclinations, but because it cannot be otherwise, that not a single word in these dramatic performances of ours should be spoken on the stage by a non-anthroposophist, even were that word spoken with the highest artistic finish and with the utmost artistic refinement of modern linguistic stage technique. For the object aimed at is totally different from the outward technique of the stage. What is now called art is not our desire. But we desire that in everyone who stands up there and plays his part, the heart should speak anthroposophically, that an anthroposophical spirit should breathe through the whole performance, whether excellent or not, that we should enjoy anthroposophy as art, art as anthroposophy. Therefore, everyone who takes part in these performances should experience the feeling that not a word is spoken which is not at the same time felt deeply in the actor's soul. This causes a certain artistic lack, which by those who are insensible to anthroposophy may be felt as amateurish, but which nevertheless marks the beginning of something which must come, of something which will one day be felt as artistic truth in the deepest, most spiritual sense of the word, however imperfect and elementary it may appear today. For this reason we need never think of cutting passages. You, who have the needful understanding, will quietly endure long drawn-out passages which are necessitated by the matter. Nothing is too long for us, nothing too undramatic in the ordinary modern sense, because we are not guided by the outer requirements of the theatre but by the inner necessities of the subject matter, and we shall never be false to our dramatic convictions. Take, for example, the fairy tale related to Capacius by Felicia in the fifth picture of my own play. The ordinary theatre-goer would say, This is deadly dull. We shall never shrink from bringing this dullness onto the stage when dramatic truth, in the anthroposophical sense, requires it of us. Dramatic freedom demands that every individual who does us the favor of his cooperation should have freedom of action in his own place, so that everyone can feel what he does or says on the stage as his own words and feelings proceeds from himself. A tyrannical management such as is favored in modern times will not be found ruling in our performances. Instead of this you will see though perhaps only in an elementary and imperfect form, the ruling spirit invisibly extended like an exhalation over this undertaking, as unity, 
but a unity which can work as multiplicity in individual souls. Therefore one who is in the midst of such an undertaking as this feels above all deep gratitude for all the sacrifices made by every single player. To all of you, from to those who fill the smaller parts, this feeling of gratitude must be here expressed. To mention each separately is impossible, as so many gave their help, but all have worked well. I need only mention one who has given himself up to the study of one of the principal parts with the utmost devotion, a part which has been especially dear to me, and which is very hard to render because of the great inner difficulties presented by it. I mean the role of Capacius, given by our good friend, I need only mention, too, the self-sacrificing manner in which our dear, blank, for two years in succession, has interpreted the part of that being whom I call the dramatic conscience, a part which cannot yet be put on the stage, but can show its vitality by not appearing in person on the stage. And how he, last year and this year again, has interpreted the role of Stader in a masterly manner. Performances such as the one presented to us in the fourth picture of my play, in the dramatic dialogue between Capacius and Strater, give an illustration of what will be when anthroposophy pulsates as life-blood in art, and art assumes a form in which anthroposophy may be embodied. Finally, I might thank you all who have shown an inner comprehension of what will be a necessity in the drama of the future, the invisible taking its place side by side with the visible, what is merely hinted at, venturing to show itself along with the actual outer representation, that some forms must be placed in a strong light, while others must be hidden away behind the mystery of the human word. What is meant and what will be felt increasingly to be the true meaning of the three forms Philea, Astrid, and Luna can only be shown in one of its aspects, in these three figures, as seen by us on the stage in bodily form. But in these three forms, which denote momentous impulses of human evolution, there is also suggested intimate mysteries of the soul, which we can only understand if we combine what, on the one hand, strongly illuminated by the glare of the footlights, compels our notice and on the other hand what is indicated in the intimacy of words. These three female figures figures working in the silvery moonlight, fashioning from the evanescent shapes taken by the spray, the chalice which subtly typifies that which they represent in their more apparent as well as in their more hidden meaning, these forms which appear to us in the silver moonlight of the fairy tale, showing us how they accompany the human soul as its closest friend. Now these are formed in the days of childhood and how they appear when thrice 360 weeks have passed. All this can only be understood if we take both aspects into consideration. The one is that which appeals to our senses and outwardly manifest is seen on the stage in a more tangible form. The other aspect which the modern theatre-goer would find so tedious, is the narration of a graceful fairy tale, the only vehicle apt to render the subtlety of meaning expressed by such figures as Luna, Astrid, and Philea. When we see that there are already a number of souls capable of entertaining pure and unprejudiced feelings toward what is not generally condoned on the stage, let us say anthroposophy is grateful to you, all for guiding and training your souls to sympathize with and to receive into their depths what has been attempted here in the service of anthroposophy. From all this you will look upon it as a matter of course that the introduction to our lectures should close with an expression of gratitude. Thankful joy fills me ever anew when I see that not only do our members work together and adapt themselves to new circumstances, as, for example, in the part of Araman, but that even those who are still outside our anthroposophical life, the stage workmen, for instance, help us willingly. This has been evident, and I feel it also as something for which to be grateful when some of the workmen have come and asked if they might not also have a book. All this, I well know, is only an imperfect beginning, 
but it is something which we are assured will bear fruit and bring about results. If, as a result of all that we have been privileged to do at the beginning of our summer gathering, one lesson reaches our souls, namely that anthroposophy must not be an abstraction, a pursuit like any other, but that it is closely bound up with all the conditions of our lives, then the modest performance which it has been our aim to accomplish will have done its work as a beginning. A part of our aim will then have been attained. In this spirit I welcome you all today to this course, which will be devoted to the consideration of many things which meet our gaze when we direct them to the great world, and when we experience that feeling of which it was said in the days of ancient Greece that all theosophy and all philosophy start from it, the feeling known as wonder, and when we experience a premonition of what is meant by trials of the soul, and are sensible of what emerges as deliverance from all wonder, as liberation from all trials, the revelations of the Spirit. What can be felt by us in regard to these three, the wonders of nature, the trials of the soul, and the freedom-bringing revelations of the Spirit, 